Okay. Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to braid meeting number three. So we've got another full load. Let's see if I can share the screen here. Uh, and here. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. We've got, uh, we're introducing status updates to, to start off because we've all been doing a lot of work and there's stuff we might not necessarily be demoing or discussing, but it might be good just to say what we've been up to. So if there's anything you want to share, um, we can do that in this update section. I put down some stuff on the page here. Then um, Angelo has a demo of using Braid with the Indie Web in his personal blog and some tools he's been making. And then we've got three other topics. I think each one will be about a half hour, um, a little bit less than a half hour. I think probably like 25 minutes since we're doing some status updates as well. And so we're going to have some time discussing the upcoming issues for the new publication of Braid HTTP. We've got some questions to resolve before we find consensus and publish the next version of the spec. Greg's going to explain the Sync9 CRDT algorithm. This is some algorithmic work we've been doing. We haven't talked about it much yet, though. And then Seth's talking, uh, going to lead us through a discussion of test suites for interoperability, which is a very important thing. And now that we're finally developing some tools, it'll be great to figure out how to fit them all together. So, um, cool. So let's start with some status. Um, first of all, we've, we, we're now, we've got a new domain name, braid.org. Um, I think it's a lot nicer than braid.news. You can use it everywhere that you used braid.news in the past. <laughs> and we'll uh, try to move all the links over. We're also renaming the GitHub organization from Braid Work to Braid Org. Um, the plain Braid was already taken, but Braid Org seems to work pretty well. And here's a little command you can use to update your local repositories for anything you've checked out from Braid Work. Although it should continue to work, um, GitHub will forward the old URL to the new one. But um, it, if someone ends up taking Braid Work, then they'll stop forwarding it. So it's maybe a good thing to do. We don't have to do it. Um, so that's overall updates. And then for me, um, so I'm currently working on the Braid.js protocol implementation. So this is implementing the regular standard Braid HTTP protocol in JavaScript. And I'm trying to make the libraries nicer so that we can release them and have a stable API that supports everything well. And making progress on that, probably be ready by our next meeting. And I'll be able to give a demo. And I'm also, um, or at least I came up with a little sketch for how to code directly on Braid. I'm wondering if anybody is interested in this because um, it'd be interesting. So I've been, I'm kind of writing up a little API. Like, so the idea, the idea here is that you could write your source code and have every like file of source code be a Braid URL. And so all the versioning can happen through Braid, so you don't need to use Git. And if someone wants to pull in your code, then they could just do it with an HTTP request, so you don't really need NPM anymore. And this also opens it up to collaborative editing, since Braid supports collaborative editing. And you could have multiple people writing code on the same branch, you know, watch your keystrokes happen. And also, since it's on the web, you could do all of your editing through the web. So today, when I write a web app, I SSH into a Unix computer. And I do some stuff in the Unix world. And then I'm like, you know, using the web app. And then I have on my local computer, maybe my own little dev environment. If everything's on the braid, then you don't need the difference between your dev, your local instance, and the server instance of the code. You don't have to like go through Git to get your code from your local to the dev. You can just, it's just kind of there. You can have different branches that you're using. And you can edit the code anywhere. So we can also edit the code in the web app. So I'm, uh, I'm looking at, I've just been, been sketching out a schema for having a web app that lets you, you can you know, hit a button on this. So imagine like any, any website built using this, you can hit a button, it'll pop up a code editor, and then you can edit the code right there. And um, it'll also show you all of the state that that page is using. You can edit the, the state using like a spreadsheet in interface and the server logs will come back to you 
um, at another URL. Um, and so I'm thinking that I'm, I'm thinking about building this braid host app that can host different, it'll have the editor, it'll have all these development tools. And um, you want this app, this host app to like stay running, even when you're, uh, you, you have a bug in your code <laughs> on your server, because you want to be able to still edit the code. And so it seems like we might have this editable web server that lets you edit stuff. So if anyone's interested in this, I'm not building it right now, but I just want to put some feelers out. Um, it'd be fun to collaborate on. And so that's it for me. That's what I'm up to. Yeah, we should talk about it. Oh yeah, Bryn? Uh, it's breaking up a little bit. Um, yeah, I was just saying we should talk about that because I have a demo that does this, but it's needs a lot of work. So I'd love to collaborate on it. Sweet, okay. Yeah, we'll set up a meeting then. Yeah, and I was just saying in chat, I'd love to. Um, I mean, if I'm around, I'm, when this week's very busy because I'm traveling, but uh, I'd love to get on that because I, yeah, care about this as well. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, then it sounds like we have enough to set up a meeting. So I'll just uh, say outcome, set up a meeting with Bryn and Seth announce on list. Okay, great. I'd, I'd be interested in being at the meeting. I wasn't going to say anything because it wasn't relevant if there's just going to be a meeting, but if it has specific participants, then. Sure, maybe we can, um, yeah, figure it out. Great. Uh, Does anyone else want to talk about what they've been up to briefly before we move on to agenda stuff? Um, I just want to very briefly mention, so uh, last time or the time before I showed that demo of my um, my UI, uh, like the idea of having like different braid documents and having an explorer with them. Um, I just want to name that I want to keep on working on that. And, um, I was hoping that's something I could demo this week, but uh, you know, I'm in Sydney at the moment and been up to a whole bunch of things, went kayaking the other day and so on. Uh, but I, I'm starting to think more and more that something like that, like something like that user or interface is something that I want in general for braid things and have like a home folder that might exist locally or something. I have a whole bunch of links and then those links can take me to different servers and I can have different content hosted there, um, you know, and have a, a like a home base from which we can explore things. So um, yeah, I'd love to like, I'd also really enjoy it at some point. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I can kick this off and talk more about it next time at the next meeting, but uh, have a, um, like I don't know, brainstorming session or something like I, I'd be interested to hear I, I'd really love it if if building that if that was something other people care about and we're interested in using and that we could all contribute to um, you know I Mike said last time he was like oh, I really want to use that interface and I was like oh that matters to me like it I'd love it if we're working on the same you know like building the same stuff so yeah Seth, would, would that be more appropriate for um, a website on, live on the internet or local first, are you thinking? I think it would be, it's tricky. I, I, I want it to be, I'd rather have a local app um, for a bunch of reasons. One of which is like right clicking and different things like that are awkward. Um, I want it to have some persistent storage of both documents and also like a bunch of links that take you out to other documents. Um, the trick with it is that I also think that the easiest way to have data have custom views is to have it have those pieces of data able to produce HTML. Um, so I can have some JavaScript code that can convert a document like a blog post into the HTML of that, of that blog post. Doing that in a native app is really awkward at the moment, um, you know, because like every platform does it as a different thing and there's no easy way to be able to ship code around in a native app in a way that can be sandboxed and so on. Like we've got WASM, but then we'll have to come up with a custom API and it's very complicated. So I'm imagining for now starting as a web app and exploring out the space of the user interface and making something useful, just maybe using IndexedDB for local documents. Um, and then later down the road, turning that into native apps, if, you know, um, ideally, um, whenever that happens. But um, I'd be happy to be convinced either way on that. Well, we, we might even be able to roll that into like a bigger apps discussion too. Like now we're, mm -hmm. we're these are like two apps that we're thinking about building. And so, yeah. um, cool. Sounds like we're, yeah. many of us are interested in the same things here too. And not just two apps, right? But like 
obviously if I've got my user interface and it's got a link to a, a project, right? Like something sitting in Redwood, I should be able to click on that. And then I can see the folder structure in Redwood and I can click on the files and so on explore that. And that can just be making braid request to Redwood and that's rules work. Yeah, yeah, this is like, it's like a uh, two different app webs that are. <laughs> yeah, or just like I see it in a, in a compatible and interoperable software. There we go. Um, you know, yeah. sitting on this new file system abstraction, like this replacement for the file system abstraction. Yeah. Great. Uh, that was, was really good to to hear for me, hearing what, what you're thinking about. Anyone else want to share what they're up to, what they've been doing, what they're thinking about right now? I had a super quick announcement sort of thing. Uh, I posted this on a list as well, but I've started extracting, for anyone who's working in Go, I've started extracting uh, utilities for creating and parsing um, braid requests. Hopefully we can all share that, uh, collaborate on it. So uh, the repo's up on the braid GitHub organization. Um. <laughs> I've been working. <clears throat> I've been working on a couple of things. One of the things is uh, more mainstream braid, trying to uh, build the prototype, showing some uh, actually getting auto merge to. I, I showed some like theoretical way to get it to work. I'm gonna get it to actually work. Um, but also on my own, I have this uh, this kind of game that's kind of similar to Dwayne's uh, realm thing. It's kind of a, a game plus more real life um anyway it's a two-dimensional grid of squares you can you can own your own square and you can link to other people's squares so it's the web except it's you know tiles and uh i've been trying to convince mike to see this in a braid way and it and these uh these these tiles can be hosted in in the braid sort of a game running on top of uh, web pages that are really a bunch of tiles hosted uh, in in the braid land. What's the uh, what's the outcome? Is it more of like a game, like you said, or is it uh, like a way to socialize or something like that? It's it's one of these crazy ideas I've had forever. I just want to do it to try it. But the idea is, it, at its best, it would be the web re-envisioned in as a two-dimensional walkable area where you can talk to people who are there. And so your web page creation experience becomes, instead of like learning HTML and creating something crappy or hiring a graphic designer, instead you have like a 10 by 10 grid of squares and you can just put tiles that are circuit you just paste tiles that everyone uses to kind of build their thing things that look like zelda tiles or whatever people can create lots of tile sets uh, you just draw your little land you have a little house there you have a little table in your house that has a, a page that people can click on to read your bio um, and people can create uh you know the snow crash world uh, a road with a bunch of leading off to people's little lands um, or whatever you can create anything it's a it's a linkable world uh, just like the web which has hyperlinks except these are geographic you can walk uh, to other people's places I'd love to chat with you sometime about it off uh, offline I feel like uh, yeah let's, uh, let's realm has there's there are a couple of uh, interesting spaces where they overlap in their in intent and uh very very much so like yeah. the, it's um this idea shares with realm that it's kind of very much a game but also very much not a game um like it's game land game mechanics but it's basically like taking the sims or you're gonna or sim city or some kind of open world kind of game and just making it getting rid of the pretense that there's any game developers with a story behind it. And it's just, you just create your own land. It's like Minecraft, except a lot easier to mod. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's, uh, well, it's in the interest of time. I think it's time to move on. Um, 
So next thing on the agenda is a demo from Angelo. Are you ready? Yeah, all right. Uh, I'd say it's probably more like a uh, visual update than a full-fledged demo, but let's Sweet. see if I can wrangle these screens. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oops. Okay, there you go. You can only pick one window when you're sharing. Is that the case? Not that I, I haven't. I noticed that in Google Meets this morning. Is uh, if that's happening in Zoom? I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, well, I, I'll just do the whole screen. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I've just been kind of stepping into how the braid feature set, if you will, will sort of work with the Indie Web. Um, and actually, like 10 minutes before, I realized that I'm now doing local development. I could have used host names to do something possibly cooler, uh, but I ran into a cores wall. So I, before I go breaking things, I'll just show you what I came to show you. Um, so this is my site. Um, I'll just show you real quick. If I uh, if I remove the database. So right now I'm sort of at a clean slate at Angelo colon 8,000. So if I create the user, uh, that's a little password. This is my home page. Um, one thing I wanted to show you is there's micro formats below the surface here. That's HTML land. But as I've been describing to a couple others, there is a way to convert that HTML back into JSON. So what I'm doing is now we're working with JSON and Braid, and I'm going to be moving JSON around and then and then rendering as HTML. So. I already had a browser extension that uh, allows you to post your own site. So I'm signed in already as Angelo. I can sign out and show you if I sign in with an HTTP Angelo 8000. And it takes me to my site. I authorize it. Now this. Firefox extension has my credentials, and this is just a little text box to post a note. In IndieWeb land, that's like the simplest possible unit, if you will, just a little tweet. Um, so I'm going to say this is a live test and watch it fail. So there, it just slotted in as undefined. Sorry, I'm doing this a little backwards. Um, now I'm going to refresh this page <laughs> and you'll see that the note came in uh, on the back end just fine. It just wasn't rendered properly. Sorry about that. What will render properly is a bookmark or a like. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm going to remove the bookmarks from here. I'm at the Indie Web website. I'm going to use my extension instead of creating a note from the new tab page. I'm going to be at an existing page and I'm going to create a response. I'm going to bookmark. So that came in, you see up here, and that came in over Braid. So it sent standard micro format JSON payload to my server, not using a put. And then this page here is my home page, and it is subscribing to itself, and it's pulling in the JSON. So not quite full braid conformance yet. This is where I'm stepping into that territory while trying to keep one foot inside of the indie web world. So this is like Angelo 8000 slash chat slash braid. I'm gonna refresh it just in case. So this is a test. So it's a chat. It is pubbing over braid. 
So if we sniff this, so testing. So it's actually sending to itself, Angelo slash chat slash braid, and it's subscribing to itself. Now, if I open, if I go to this in another window over here, let's refresh, move this over. So now, now testing comes in both places, backwards, scroll down, it's in both places. So I've kind of got the full sort of pub sub uh, routine in place, and it is using a Redis backend over Python G events. I don't know, I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but the pub and the sub is working in this context. And what I wish I could have shown you right now, I was scrambling two minutes before, was I set up, can you guys see this? Alice, Bob, and Carol over here. So this is them on their own site. Bear with me here. Uh, <laughs> ignore that, that was hard coded. Um, so ideally, I tried to hard code all of the, the slash chat slash braids to put to Angelo's, but test it fails cores <laughs> so uh i thought i had cores wrangled but apparently there's levels <laughs> so when that cores doesn't fail i should be seeing bob should be on his own page sending a message over and i on my own site will see bob cole and then what he said and i think there's just a little cores hang up standing in between that being live right now, or at least in Python. And just to finish it off, um, I had mentioned that maybe chat wasn't like quite so indie web like, but actually there just hasn't been much effort in that direction. What I'm gonna be doing is I'm going to write, just as this is a note, you'll see, yikes. Um, if you see, this is a note denoted by an H entry with a P content. That's a note in IndieWeb parlance. I'm going to do the same thing for each chat post. So it'll be like, this page will be essentially a fee, an H feed of H entries, not unlike my homepage. It'll have a different pub sub mechanism but it'll ultimately be fueled by or, you know, powered by Braid in the end. <laughs> That's really dope. So it's, so it's, it's using Braid to synchronize the HTML with the server, but then it's displaying the HTML or it's like the client to the server is like Braid in this case, but then in, from the client up, it's exposing that HTML using micro formats that are indie web. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, you can, probably ignore the uh, the microformats and the HTML component of it. Um, I'm just trying to sort of make two worlds meet. But ultimately, I'm just, all of these resources are going to have a subscribable braid data structure coming, you know, via a 209. Um, while simultaneously the get representation is going to have a full one-to-one -one HTML representation of it. And, cool. and as things come in from the JSON braid, they need to be sort of slotted in using the micro formats. So there's sort of this hybrid just sort of appearing in front of me and I'm trying to hold on <laughs> tight. <laughs> But I think this chat is kind of the peer-to-peer -peer sort of uh, design uh, uh, structure that I'm most interested in. And I think it helps because um, there isn't really like a hole punching problem or like a WebRTC has that uh, turn server thing. And there's, there always seems to be a, a central server necessary shucks. But this kind of, you already have like central servers as like a core part of the underlying system. So, And I highly encourage others to experiment braid with braids on their own sites. Because especially with braids, I can like then connect to your braids and just see what 
kind of JSON structures come back and whether or not I can inter interop with that out of the gates or whether I have to actually like communicate with you directly. That's a big part of the indie web thing. Like you can always view source the other people's pages. A question for you, uh, yeah. Angelo. So um, you mentioned that you were not using put when you uh, send an update. And I was curious what uh, what you were using instead is, or, or more specifically, are you using some kind of stream update or? Well, so I'm uh, this, the, the chat example uses puts. Okay. But the indie web posting of resources is using micropub. So that's essentially a glorified post to like your homepage. Well, your micropub endpoint. So okay. for me, it's angelogladi.com slash pub. So, and this is kind of a curious thing in, in, in the braid world, you sort of like, how do you append to a feed? You have to sort of like, you have to append to the, yeah, I, I feel like there's some confusion. Um, what we do in the indie web is we post the entry first and that, and this sort of micro pub architecture is the way in which that works. You send an entry, just a generic like adjacent structure to this endpoint. And the endpoint says, ah, I see, this is an entry. It's a recent entry, you want it to be posted now. You only want it to be to certain audiences. You have these tags, this content, it's a like of, and then your Micropub endpoint does whatever it wants with it. And it'll create a nice little URL for you. Whereas in the braid world, I almost feel like you have to sort of like know how to put to the URL to create it. So there isn't like a post mechanism. So you have to fall back to sort of like inserting at the end of the array of sort of like the feed itself with a link maybe. Gotcha. I don't know. I don't understand so it well enough. There's almost like a, like a hopper that you can just toss anything into in, uh, in I guess in, in um, micro format standards, is that right? So you could say like, here's an entry or you know what the endpoint is, here's the URL. You can be like, here's an entry or maybe some somebody else is like, here's a comment and it'll just like figure out what to do with it and then put it to like, it'll kind of uh, bifurcate into separate resources that you can then retrieve at different URLs later. Yeah, except it's only for your own posts. Okay. And it's micro pub. So micro, for publishing micro pub. thank you. Pub. And then uh, when other people want to post responses and comments and likes, et cetera, they post on their own sites using their own micro pub. And then they send a web mention, which notifies me that theirs exists. And then I can do whatever I want with it. So it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of pub sub dances out there. Um, there's definitely some overlap here that one might, you know, step on the other, but then there's definitely like some things that Braid does that the IndieWeb world cannot do and it's preventing them from going full real time. So ta-da, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so I don't know, did I answer your question? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you did. Thank you. That's helpful. It's, it's really cool to see uh, two compatibility layer uh, faces working here, Braid and Micropub. Really cool. Yeah, I love seeing this too. Thanks, Angela. This is uh, very inspiring work, seeing these um, come together and then seeing like now we can see the differences and see how to mesh better. Um, well, yeah, go ahead. I'm standing the, on the shoulders of lots of giants, right? Now I'm like, you know, standing on top of yours now, like to boot. So I'm getting all these freebies because of the fact that like, you know, I can just make a browser extension in Firefox and I don't, you know, I'm not like locked out of IPFS or Hypercore or something. Um, but at the same time, like Braid is sort of in the, op is like in the open web territory. So I can use Braid. So it really just sort of slots in very well in, in Lots of cool ways. Yeah, I, I have something as well. Can you guys hear me clearly? Better, yeah. Great, great work, by the way. Something that, that's interesting, and I know I know we're eventually moving towards this, but let's say we wanted to pull in, like, I have a project and I want to implement notifications, right? Or something common like comments. If we 
you know, I, I think we were talking about doing standardization, but if I had a, a standard way of handling notifications and a stream I could push these to, instead of me building my own separate notification that is my own database, I can then push to the stream and I have one universal page to where I can see all the notifications. Because right now the most frustrating thing on the web is I have a notification for Facebook, Instagram, GitHub. So yeah, I think as we go more towards finding standardization, how we want those to look, I think it'd be a great way to not only shortcut, like having to build these like really rudimentary uh, features, but I, I think with what you had, you had three separate chat applications and the chat schema usually follows the same thing, right? It has the content body, I think you talked about there would have to be different versions to it because there might be uh, an older version of a, a comment stream that doesn't implement emojis. I think Mike, that was the example that you use, but yeah, no, I thought that was really cool. I think we have examples of, of, uh, of levels of support for messages even today, because if you think about the notification you receive on your mobile phone, um, you basically just get like a, like a title and a message, right? When you when you when you look at your phone, it's like, oh, that's all. But it doesn't support, you know, emojis or images or anything else. So uh, even the notification center that we currently have has this concept of a like bare metal version of a of a message. And I think we could probably have that with all sorts of um, systems integrated together, so that you're in control of that notification system, even without all the cool, you know bells and whistles. While we're on really the topic cool of to notif yeah. notifications, uh, Michael, you were updating the wiki while it was open in my tab. And I was asking the question about what you were adding to the wiki in chat. If only there was a notification of some sort. <laughs> I just, so that's why I put that enable notifications button on that chat page. <laughs> I was like, well, while I'm here, I might as well figure out. And they don't work very well <laughs> inside the browser system yet. It would be nice to have a universal system that's sort of like all channeled in through my own domain and then like came to whatever client I had open at the time. That would be nice. Uh, let's do one more comment question before we move on. I think Seth, you're going to say something. Okay. okay, well then, well, let's just roll. I was, I wanted to ask you, Angela, about the, um, how you're doing auth with all these users. I assume it was indie auth. Um, like you had three different Alice, Bob, and Carol. Are they indie authing in to post their braid messages with their indie auth account? Like I said, I just scrambled at the last second to get the Alice, Bob, and Carol to like fit equal out. <laughs> equally on the screen because that's what I do. <laughs> and I was like thinking of all the thousands of possibilities I can now explore locally because I just modified my host file. So um, I'm just now thinking about it. And as I was just describing with the whole uh, web mention component where you post to your own site and then notify interested parties, particularly the parties that you've already linked to. For example, you would post a chat note, chat message on your own site, and you would link to Angelo 8000 slash chat slash brave as like, uh, like, this is the channel in which this note was posted to or in reply to or in the topic of you know as on your site and then you would notify my site my site would go read your site see that you posted a note see that it is in response to this chat stream and then it would place it on the stream so that's a really cumbersome <laughs> event process for real-time chat so, but that's the IndieWeb way. And the reason the IndieWeb probably still uses IRC for chat is because their flow is too cumbersome and slow. So um, I think I'm still gonna run with that whole like concept of notes being posted to your own site, but I'm also going to send a braid pub over 
so that it's immediately recognized and then after the fact you can go and like actually make sure that the person that pubbed you has indeed posted their, to their own site and there's consequences to that that are uh, related to like trust and uh, I trust and identity right um, if you have to sort of like post all of this stuff to your own site then other people can eventually see okay this guy is just a total troll and nothing but so just block his domain or something um, whereas if he's just sort of like putting anonymously yeah yeah uh, so I don't know if I'll necessarily be using the indie auth for the put itself, I might just allow the puts to go through and then verify after the fact that the note does exist from the, on the origin site. The other problem with well, that put style is that um, you can lose messages. So like if the, if the server that you're posting to is restarting or redeploying or something, then it's possible that you'll just never get that put message. Which is one of the reasons why I much prefer the pull style of subscribing to another remote HTTP connection of like, you know, what I hold open the TCP connection and then once my server restarts, I can reopen the connection, request any messages that I might have missed while I was offline because it's got better um, properties around reliability. That was actually the alternate uh, option that I posted to chat. It would essentially in this, in this demo, it would be instead of Alice, Bob, and Carol putting to Angelo's site, it would be them putting to their own slash chat slash grade. And then my Angelo site subscribing to all three of them, right? So yeah, then it, that would be a subscribe first as you're describing. And it did, it did indeed seem like a more robust <laughs> implementation but it changes the dynamics non-trivially. Great. It seems like we would want to- we're, we're running low on time actually. You should probably- Okay. Sorry. At some point I have to cut someone off. I felt bad, but <laughs> I just did it. Um, so up next we have, um, Greg's gonna present the Sync9 algorithm. So I've, uh, here's, here's what I'm setting up for our agenda so we can get done in time. We have uh, an hour and 20 minutes. So um, we've got Greg next uh, and then Seth. And then in the remaining time, we can deliberate braid HTTP 03 issues. I figured this can kind of expand to fill whatever space we need. So it'll give us a little bit of flex time. So, um, okay. So we're now we're gonna go through, uh, talk about the, the Sync9 CRDT algorithm. This is something that I've been uh, collaborating with Greg on and the, the goal here, or like a few of the design goals was, it was nice for us to be working with a real CRDT and a nice synchronizer as we're designing this protocol, because we wanted to make sure that it's gonna work, it's gonna be general, and it's gonna be able to be high performance. Because every synchronizer has a different protocol, it has a different way of representing its own internal data. And we wanted to have, a, you know, the big hypothesis here is that we can have interoperable synchronizers which means that we can have them use the same protocol and represent their data in this in a common way. So Sync9 has been our exploration of trying to make a general and high performance synchronizer that speaks the Braid protocol. And it is unique amongst other synchronizers in a couple of ways. Uh, one is that it has uh, a replace semantics. There are times in which, so most uh, CRDTs will, if you re like replace some text, like you highlight a string and then you paste something else in there, it'll represent that as a delete followed by an insertion. There are some cases in which if multiple people replace or insert and delete at the same time in the same place, the semantics actually change for how things should be ordered in the end. And we wanted to know that this would be a general thing. So we actually went that far to, to give it that distinction and that semantics. And that's, that's a little bit unique. Um, it also is unique that it's able to speak the range patch protocol where it speaks in terms of offsets and offsets at a version. So it says you replaced this uh, from region five to 10 at version six. Whereas most CRDTs will communicate in terms of a patch ID and say that this patch is connected to patch X9J5. Um, and Sync9 does have patch IDs internally, 
but it translates it into the braid protocol as a proof of concept to so that, that can work. And um, we wanted to make it really fast. We made it, um, it's big O, uh, every, all the operations are big O and the number of versions that are outstanding. And we didn't try to optimize beyond that because the, what we wanted to do is prune down the number of versions over time so it can remove old history. So we're not gonna give um, an explanation in this talk of how it does that pruning. That'll be for a, an upcoming one, but it makes it possible to prune history. Um, and so that was, um, that's a little introduction and I'll let Greg go from here. You're on mute. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Um, I, assume, I assume people can hear me. I was covering my screen when all the, I assume thumbs up. Sounds good. Great. Um, all right, can people see my screen? Great, okay. Um, so I have two windows kind of prepared here. We're gonna jump back and forth between them a little bit. Also, I apologize, there's some construction happening uh, near me. I would go elsewhere in the house, but I'm not like, I think everywhere is equidistant from the noise. It's um, not too bad. Great. So can people read this on the side? I can zoom in the font. Uh, can Yes. Okay. Um, at the highest level for, for the purposes of this talk, there's, there's sync nine. And then buried within sync nine is something that uh, I like to call sync eight. I mean, it was called sync eight before it was wrapped at sync nine. And what sync eight is, is it's a CRDT that deals with an array of stuff or really text. Um, what sync nine adds to the equation is JSON support. And we're not gonna go, I'm gonna kind of hand wave how it does JSON support. Uh, but the basic idea is that JSON has just kind of four things in it. It has maps and it has arrays and it has numbers and it has strings. Um, the maps internally are gonna be a key and then one of these sync eight data structures uh, at that key in order for us to know what the current value is at that key. If people set the key, what they're really doing is they're, um, they're messing with this underlying array and they're replacing the first element with their thing. And whichever thing wins as being the element there is, is the thing that's actually used as the value for this key. Um, can, in array, can that thing be well, a number as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, um, this is recursive. So inside of the sync eight data structure, uh, you have an array uh, of things, which could be um, another CRDT sitting there. Okay, so the text comment there is, is like that's its probably best use case, but it could also be an array of numbers. When I first created the sync eight data structure, it was in fact text, but it was quickly generalized to being a, a true bona fide JavaScript array that can have JavaScript objects of absolutely any kind, but we're using a recursive set of these sync nine things, which um, like a, a map can be inside of a map if you want to do that. Um, and it bottoms out um, wherever, wherever, you wherever you decide. Um, the way the API works for it, it's sort of up to you when you drill into it to know <laughs> when it's gonna bottom out. Cool. Um, I, I lied a little bit. The, the current API, it, it's not good to bury things in it because when you first set things, it's gonna recursively look in there. In particular, it's gonna look for strings and it's gonna expand the strings into being a sync eight <laughs> data structure uh, to represent that string. So all arrays are represented as an underlying sync eight data structure. Strings are an underlying sync eight data structure and numbers are just themselves. Uh, so that's how JSON is done. Uh, but then sync eight itself is the CRDT for arrays. Um, 
And that's what we're really going to learn, like, in my mind, what it, mean, what it means to learn how a CRDT works, to understand the, uh, the algorithm, you might say, of the CRDT. Uh, to me, that means understanding the, the data structure and how to manipulate that data structure. And the, the sync eight data structure, that's what we're going to look at. I'll give you just a, a super brief hint. Here it is down, <laughs> down here, where it says, hello. Um, it'll branch and things in a moment that will, it, it's just a, here's another example of, it's just a kind of a tree looking thing. Um, we're gonna go over inserting things into it, uh, deleting things from it, and these replaces that Mike mentioned. Um, so without further ado, let's drill into it. Um, so here we have the, uh, the word hello, and I'm going to type in the letter A after it. I'm going to turn the network speed down here. I'm going to go to a, a node that's way over here. I'm going to type in A on this node, and then I'm going to quickly jump over to this node and type B after the word hello. So here we have an A. You can see the network messages there traveling, so i got to be quicker than that. And we'll put a B over here. Um, all right. So now we can relax for a moment. Or we can let things, so let's see what happened. We have hello, and then there's this little line going down to the B. So when we put a, the letter B after hello, um, ah, now you can see it. It received word about A from down here. And now there are two little lines coming down here from, from A and B. And it has this text written beneath each one. And that is the, well, it's the first three letters of the version. The version ID is longer, but just for our sanity, this shows a small part of it. Um, but that's the version ID of the version that created that, uh, that text. Now, what do I mean by the version ID? Well, there's this other, um, sorry, I'm moving. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see it, but I can see ourselves. I don't think you guys can see it. So I was just moving ourselves to unhide the time dag here. Uh, so at the top, so this is a, um, this CRDT has two data structures that are sort of playing with each other. It has this, uh, this so-called time DAG, which I'll explain here in a moment. It's very simple. And it has this so-called so space DAG, uh, which is the thing that we're really looking at that holds the information. So the time DAG is, the only things in it are so-called versions, and they have IDs and they have parents. And we'll use this information as we traverse the space DAG. Um, anyway, so let's take a look at the time DAG and what happened. There's this, there's this thing called RU, which is the first three letters of root, which is the kind of uh, bogus version that just exists for everyone without anything happening. Um, well, that's sort of true. There, there was a, a person in this node um, or in this simulation who wrote out the word hello, and that exists in the root version. Now, there's these two other versions coming out of it, and they, they, they come out separately from each other. One of them is FGZ. And if we look down here, FGZ, that's the letter A that we typed. And over here is K and Z, and that's, we can see K and Z down here, and that's the letter B that we typed. And so one of these versions could is, see. Is everyone able to see those? I, the bottom of my screen is um, clipped, maybe? Oh. I can uh, see them. Oh. Um, I'm going to, let's see, can you? Oh, there we go. Yeah, let's close this guy. Um, trying to decide how insecure it is to trying to see if there's anything on my back. Maybe we should uh, open maybe. those up so that we can see if they're private or not. <laughs> I think they're uh, whatever. It's probably fine. Um, all right, can every uh, everyone can see the hello AB here? Um, yes. So I in in explaining this, I took too long and it actually compressed all the versions down to to a single version. Um, but uh, and you can see that version is. IKH, which is, uh, if people were watching on the side, it actually created this 
kind of bogus version to unify the version so that it could collapse them down. Um, but I'll just create a couple of, we'll just type again, except this time just for educational purposes, I'm gonna type between, so I'm, I'm in the word hello here, but I'm before the A, I'm gonna put, I don't know, an X. Um, so here's something we didn't see before. Um, before it just added the letter uh, going down here, but now since we did it in the middle, it chopped it and you can see this horizontal line that goes over to the AB. Um, conceptually, this is a, a single node in the graph, you might say, hello AB, that has a, a thing sticking out of part of it. Um, this is easier to represent this as two separate nodes with a, a horizontal line. To do, like that horizontal line means that this is the rest of the node that we are. Whereas these lines that go down, well, they used to go down, I'll make another one. Whereas these lines that go down, the difference there is that we may or may not actually traverse that line depending on if we, um, if the version that we're reading off includes that thing or not, depending on the version ID. Um, so insertions are, they're the main thing and they're, <laughs> they're pretty simple, like they seem simple. It seems like all you do is you just put something, uh, you just kind of break the node and then insert uh, the thing that got inserted with this version ID. Um, so the next layer of complication in this onion of what's going on is if two things happen at once. So let's, uh, let's do the two things happening at once. Again here, I'm gonna put an A there and a B here. Um, and these are in the same place, like they're both after the Y. And so it'll have to make a decision about what to do in the end about whether the A or the B will appear first. And what'll happen in the end is they'll wind up both children of this A, I mean, of this Y here. So you can see that they're both children of Y and it put them in some order. And the order that it put them in is according to the version IDs of those two insertions. I mean, the patches you might say, in a sense, they don't have a version ID. There's just the version of the text at that time, but we just label the patch with the version ID of the version that it first was created in, and it sorts them by that. So that's the second layer of the onion. It's how, what do you do if multiple people insert at the same time, at the same place, you sort by the version ID. Um, but then the next layer of complication is that that's um, it's sort of not enough. Uh, we can see over here um, an example of what I mean by it not being enough. So if we, actually we can maybe just create, create the example here. Um, if somebody types, if somebody inserts something, let's say an A at the end here, uh, and somebody elsewhere inserts something else, let's say a B in the same spot, um, but then they press the cursor backwards and type another letter like X, um, we can see a weird thing happened here. The X, it didn't go, it didn't go right after the B. Um, now, now you can see the A has made its way over here. Uh, so after the B, there's an A, and then there's also this B, but it has the X kind of sitting in a weird place right before the B. And that's the layer that I'm going to explain now. Um, the issue is if all of the things that are inserted after this B are all just children of the B, uh, then depending on the version IDs, uh, you run the, the terrible risk that the version IDs cause this B to be sorted before this X, even though it's very clear that this X was inserted uh, in front of this B. Like I saw that B when I inserted it and I put it in front of it. So there should be no world in which it's sorted after it. Um, and so the, like the way that sync nine solves this problem uh, is that whenever you're inserting something into some spot, 
uh, the place where you're inserting it is going to have some children. And if you happen to have seen any of those children, uh, then the first one that you've seen, you sort of recursively uh, put yourself sort of just in front of that thing. Um, a little bit weird to explain, but in this case, you can see here there's A, B, and then there's this A dangling down. If I were to insert myself um, right after that B, then it would, it would jump to be, to actually be inserted uh, here uh, just before the A, like it's in the same node uh, in the space tag, and there's kind of a, a fake empty node that has, has no letters, that has a child that is the X that I inserted. Um, and that's actually recursive, mm -hmm. like it's, if we, uh, if I pressed backspace and inserted a Y right after this B, uh, you can see it again here, and I could press backspace, and I could kind of create a, a I was careful about it, I could create a, well, you can see a, a tower here. Do, 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 do. Um, so that is how insertions work. That's the magic behind insertions. And that's, that's basically the whole thing. I'm gonna now explain, uh, you know, just a couple more things. There's deletions and replaces, but these are both very easy in comparison. And I'm, I welcome any questions about <laughs> insertion. Uh, but let's go over deletion because it's so easy. Um, so let's say I want to delete this X. You can see it here. I have the X here. I'm going to just press backspace on it. Bloop. Um, now that X has a red line through it. And, and that, so it's marked as deleted. And that's how deleted things work. Um, as Mike mentioned, it'll be, it'll be compressed away. And we're not talking about how it will be compressed away, but it's uh, but it will be, so it's not so bad that it's sitting there because eventually it'll go away. But there it is, there's the X and it just has a line to it. We could delete something else and it's just gonna put lines through all of those things. So you see, you could see it did some compression. These were separate things, um, but it was able to compress them into a single node of three letters deleted in a row. Um, so that is how deletions work. When you delete something, it just marks those nodes in the graph as deleted. Um, it marks them with the version ID under the hoods here. It doesn't show it, but it, it knows which versions deleted this thing. Um, and it may have been deleted by more than one version. And the reason that it needs that is that when you uh, send information to somebody else to say what edit you made, um, it's sending those edits in the braid format. And the braid format, as Mike mentioned, is using offsets. And so it needs to basically start at the beginning and count along and it needs to know when it gets to one of these deleted things uh, whether it should skip it or not because uh, that particular version may or may not know about that deletion uh, and it it uses the the time dag to know whether it knows about it or not basically if one of its parents in the time dag uh, knows about the deletion then um, then it will count it as deleted, and if, it, if they don't, then it won't. Um, all right. The final thing, uh, replaces. Um, the short story of replaces is that uh, we looked at the semantics of replaces, and there exists a semantics of replaces um, that carries forward uh, the meaning of replaces, and there's at least one example where, uh, where you can kind of see the meaning. Uh, but you can do it with just inserts and deletes, basically. We do have to add one weird thing to make this work. So I'm gonna take a bunch of text here and I'm gonna replace it with the letter K. Boop. Um, now the space tag looks kind of normal-ish. Uh, you can see a lot of stuff was deleted and there's the K and it looks like the K was just inserted. The only weird thing is there's this dot sitting here. Now, what this dot means is that I wasn't inserted, I mean, I was inserted after this O, uh, but the dot really, it, it just adds a level of 
uh, precedence, kind of like uh, operator ordering in, in math, where multiplication comes before addition. Uh, in the same way, this dot kind of says that this insertion here is more closely bound to this deletion that's sitting here. You know, it's closer that way than it is. It's not, it wasn't just inserted after the letter O. It was, it was part of the thing that was after it. Uh, now, where this matters is um, we can do a little example here where on one machine here, we're going to replace the K with an A. But on a different machine, we're going to simply um, type the letter A after, um, after O. Um, I think I confused myself about what is, <laughs> okay, here, <laughs> um, let's see, did I, I replaced one of these, I should have done it with a B for the other one, goodness, well, <laughs> whatever, um, I replaced the K with an A, and I also inserted an A, which I should have inserted the B to make it more clear. Um, if we didn't do this replace thing, you could imagine that this A would be sorted before this B um, based on their version IDs. But this dot prevents that from happening. And there's good reason to think that the B should definitely come before the A. And that is that this A is a replacement of this K. And when we typed the B, we knew about the K and we typed our B before the K. And so it would be very strange for somebody to replace the K with an A and have that A appear after, or have that K appear before uh, somebody who inserted something before the K. I don't know, does this make sense? <laughs> um, so that's the idea of the replace. And it, it um, so it's, at the end of the day, it's very simple as well. It was not simple to sort of arrive at that way of doing it, but uh, in the data structure, it's it's just an extra bit. Every um, every node in the in the space tag has a bit that says whether it has one of these dots at the end, which is this kind of a filler thing, and allows for if we insert another thing after this L, then it's going to go before the dot because the dot you only get a B after the dot if you replace stuff that's after it. Um, and that's it. That's the, uh, that's how sync nine works. That was 24 minutes. So I think that there may be like three minutes for, for questions. Are there any questions? I just wanted to say Benjamin thanks for going chat. slowly. I appreciated oh. the speed. Thank you. Great. Just going to say, Ben asked in chat, what happens if you delete a portion up to a, up to a top right node, but in the bottom left node, inject something into that deleted portion? Let's do it. In the top right node, let's see, I'm going to open the chat here so you can see exactly what is desired. What happens if you delete a portion up in a top right node? All right, I'm in the top right node, I'm going to delete a portion. Boop. Uh, but in a bottom left node, inject something into that deleted portion. Okay, so the deleted portion included this, this L and this D, or this E and this L. So let's insert it between those guys, um, the letter U. I inserted it between the E and the L, which were deleted. Um, let's see what happens. All right, that message gets there. It deletes those things. Uh, the U is just sitting there where it was, so those things were sort of deleted out from around the U. The U is still there. It sort of adheres to the principle that anything that is inserted anywhere will be there unless it's deleted by anyone anywhere, in which case it will go away. Um, any more questions? And you all can uh, feel free to open bloop.monster slash braidviz and oh yeah, yourself too. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, just a little 
plug. Mike is talking about creating this editor kind of thing. I, I, I'm totally on board with that. And I'm, this is my kind of like, this is a code editor. If I save this, uh, it will modify the code that's over here and reload it. It's sitting in S3 and this edit thing is just another file that's there. And here I am editing edit. And this is the code for the editor, uh, which uses Monaco and some Firebase uh, credentials so that only I can save it. Um, uh, not anymore. <laughs> now these Firebase credentials are public, as you can see. The, the, oh. You log in to Firebase. So the, the secret bits are sitting in Firebase. And hopefully <laughs> you have to have my Google login for it to allow you to retrieve them. Anyway. That's really cool. I um, yeah, I want to say I really appreciate that visualization, and I'd love to see a similar visualization for um for auto merge and some of the other CRDTs. I think it would be super enlightening for people. Um, although obviously, like you know, you're under an obligation to make something like that, but I feel like it's like the right way to express it, which is cool. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I also just to name it for people who haven't seen this before, like my personal uh, worry about this particular style of doing the pruning is that um, it's like what happens when clients are coming and leaving a lot of the time. So I open up my phone, I open up a document on my phone, my phone goes into a tunnel, I close my web browser while I'm in the tunnel because it stops working. I don't open the browser up again. And now I've got this node that's been disconnected um, and might never come back. So like if the node never comes back, then you know the network has to like store, is maybe storing some extra information. So Although I'll, Mike's pointed out. Yeah. I'll give you kind of a, you can kind of see a little preview of the answer to that here. Is it like the, um, the positive, I can get, I'll give you a positive spin answer and a negative spin answer to kind of clarify sure. the, the reality. Um, the negative spin answer is that uh, in, in the worst case, if you really wanted to do it perfectly and we're claiming it does it perfectly for any network splits, uh, you'd have to store something for absolutely every single one of those network splits that you're talking about. What you would have to store is um, some information that freezes certain versions in the sync nine data structure and says, don't mess with these. Um, the, the positive spin on this is you, uh, those can collapse away once you see these people again, and you don't have to keep them forever. The, the merely the only consequence of getting rid of one of these uh, fissures, so-called these things that saves what you need to know to reconnect with somebody is that you won't be able to reconnect with that person. Well, I yeah. mean, that's sort of true. It's a network split. It doesn't know the actual person, but like that network partition <laughs> won't be able to un-network yeah. partition. Yeah. The, we'll, we'll yeah. get more to this uh, next time too. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. But um, yeah, I mean, it almost it's like, it's another feature on top of what AutoMerge does. To so say AutoMerge optimizes to try and make it so that storing all the information forever is as small and compact as possible. This means that there's another way that we don't have to store all that information together. But also like, I don't know, I feel like the confusion of both of them of having a really compact structure and also being able to print history would be really powerful. I agree. And I do see it as a, as a trade-off because we are storing something like in a sense we're storing, in certain cases, we're storing more than auto merge would. Because mm. um, you know, if there's a bunch of disconnects at some point, you know, the majority of the information stored is just sort of repeated information that this disconnect needs to store this version. And also this disconnect needs to store this version. Cool. I'll okay. stop sharing my screen. Great. Uh, that was really fun. Thanks, Greg. So Thanks everyone for, for listening. I hope that was clear. Uh, Seth, would you like to take us through your topic of testing? I I would, and um, hopefully, like I expect this will take, uh, this will be much quicker. Um, so, uh, and I don't have prepared slides or anything. So let me just talk about like my goal uh, in this topic. What I'd like, so we've, we've currently got an increasing number of braid implementations, which is really awesome to see. Like I've written some JavaScript code that does some braid stuff. Mike's got his version of the code. Um, uh, Bryn's got a version of the braid implementation in Go. I've been writing a bit of a um, braid server implementation in Rust for a project. That I'm 
I'm working on, like there's more and more code that wants to speak this language in this protocol. And um, I don't think we're doing a very good job yet in terms of the interoperability. Um, so like it's one thing to read a spec and make an implementation that works with your own server and client. It's another thing to have different implementations that can talk to each other and can reliably talk to each other. So I feel like anything that speaks Braid um, can talk to my server. Uh, from that perspective, like um, I think that the best way forward to do this is to do test, have a test suite. Um, so what I want to have is um, actually, let me just pull it up. Uh, uh, I would love to have a compatibility table with all of the Braid features. Um, sorry, where's the screen sharing button? Um, which, so if anyone's seen this, I don't, sorry, it's loading slowly because I'm on mobile. Um, the, this is a, a table of different JavaScript implementations and all of a bunch of different ES6 features. And obviously this table is huge, um, but I'd really like to have something like this be automatically generated for Braid where we can have our different implementations across the top, have a bunch of different Braid features going down the side and we can see which features are supported by which different implementations. And so you can see like, oh, I want to go implementation of Braid, great. There's the go implementation of Braid, great. What's the features that I want? Cool, um, you know, great. Thank you so much, Grin. I'm going to use your implementation of Braid. Uh, so something like this is what I want. And to be able to make something like this, like you'll see, say in, in this example, if I click on any of these different tests, uh, I should be able to, sorry, the, um, oh no, that's taking me to this back. Uh, there's a way in which like in there somewhere to be able to see the actual code that's being executed. And that code is executed on different, um, uh, like on each of the JavaScript environments um, that are being tested uh, and then the testing for spec conformity. So what I'd like to do is start making that list for Braid. And obviously it's not gonna be anywhere near as complicated. Um, I think the principle of uh, um, like, if, you know, there's this idea of hallway usability testing where like, if you can just get like six or seven people to test your software, you're gonna find about 90% of the issues, you know, like 90% like of the value in a test suite comes from the first handful of tests that you add. So I think for now, that's the right goal to reach. So um, yeah, so I've been starting to think about, you can see on the uh, on the Braid meeting page, uh, which I'll just share briefly. Um, uh, I've been starting to brainstorm different features that we have that we want to test. Um, what I'd like to have is a, um, a series of client server messages. So like, you know, say for, for patches or like say for um, custom patch types, um, we can have a test where we say, here's the specification of this super simple patch type. Here's some braid HTTP uh, server and client messages going back and forth, talking about the document, saying, here's the document, uh, you know, here's a series of subscription messages. Here's a message from the client, from a client. Here's the subscription message that comes in acknowledging that patch um, and, and the uh, extra patch being sent through a subscription. Um, and that can be uh, like, some text files like this. I'm not expressing, I'm not imagining expressing this in code, but a standard set of text files that we can consume in each of our implementations or like point at each of our implementations with a little like test harness. Um, and then we can see whether or not the output from the server is what we expect or the output from the clients, what we expect, you know? So here's the, here's the data, here's the semantics that we expect, you know, and it can have a, some, um, uh, some, you know, obviously like if the server output some extra headers or something, that's fine. But if the server like, you know, can't express some of these features, then that's something that we need to know about. So um, anyway, so this is something that I wanna do. I, I'd love to hear, like open up the room to thoughts and ideas about this. And also um, please open up this wiki page and edit it and or say, speak out loud if you don't wanna type things straight into the wiki page. I have other features that would be useful to add in the very first version of this um, that we can add into our feature set. So, yeah. I'll just add that uh, micro micropub.rocks. Mm -hmm. Check that website out. Um, I mean, you obviously have your own. Uh, what was that? ES6 support or something? I don't know. We were talking oh, about this is the. Yeah, cool. So, um, so client reports, server yeah. reports, and it's like super simple and it does the trick and it helped me certainly wrap my yeah. head around micropub. So. Great. Awesome. Um, yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing I want. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I also think about things like the, like, you know, Rust, like, are we fast yet? Are we async yet? Are we whatever yet? I can imagine having, like, a, are we braid yet or something, and then just have, like, different braid implementations and their feature support. Um, yeah, like, this is super complicated, but we don't need anything that's complicated to get most of the value out of it. Um, so, yeah. Oh, and let me also just, like, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, let me just, like, name what each of these different features are. So. 
I want like snapshot updates of like, oh, there's a server, I've got my CPU temperature, it just every second outputs my new CPU temperature. The client should be able to consume that and understand the CPU temperature changing. Um, versions, so um, with each update, the server outputs a new version, even if the value goes, changes from A to B and then back to A again, the version has still changed each of those times um, and the client can consume that. And the client should also be able to, uh, actually maybe I'll, I'll type in, the client should be able to reconnect and say, hey, I knew what the document was at version X. Um, and then the server should acknowledge that and um, understand that it, um, it doesn't need to send changes if that version is the same as what it currently is. Uh, patches, so now instead of just sending a new version and you uh, copy of the whole document, now instead we're sending incremental changes. Um, so like, you yeah, know, here's a patch, here's a patch, here's a patch. Um, and maybe those patches should be expressed with the content ranges header because that seems to be the like, you know, home, home base for this stuff. I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, then there's a couple of the features like the up-to-date header. So the server can say, you know, hey, like um, the most recent version is X, but I'm gonna send you versions from, you know, from like N and then is NMNOP up to X. Um, custom patch types, which I mentioned, merge types. So like here's two different changes that uh, branch off from the, the from a base version. Um, and here's the way I'm gonna name the algorithm in which the client's expected to merge these together. Um, so Mike and I have chatted about this. I don't think we've talked about it um, outside, but I'd like Braid to be able to support both clients connecting and just receiving a series of patches that they can apply directly immediately locally or um, having a full time DAG like uh, Greg was just showing us. Um, and then having the, the client be like, well, I've got the code that influence sync nine. So I know how to merge like this delete and this insert together both into my local document um, and having that be named. But uh, yeah, sweet. Um, uh, that's that's the other things that came off the top of my head. But um, yeah, sorry, I'm gonna stop talking. Um, please uh, <laughs> speak your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's that's an awesome idea. And I think it, it like reinforces um how how great it is to have like, you know, a, a public protocol on this rather than every, everyone carrying on doing um their own thing in this in this space. Cause it it means like um yeah, with with one one test harness, it's like everyone in the whole community's code can kind of get get leveled up. Um yeah. yeah. Great idea. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. So it'll be a website, right? Yeah, I want I want a test suite and a website. So the test suite is like you know I'm not exactly sure what the format of this, and even if they're manually ran at the start, that's fine. Like here's a series of HTTP messages back and forth, right? In oh. a series of text files, maybe in a repository, and then here's a website where we've taken those different um, those different message streams, we've sent them and received them from a different client and server implementations. And here's the table that shows compatibility. So it shows which of the tests pass and which of the tests fail. Um, that's what I want to make. So the test suite itself would be kind of like a, like it would be a library or GitHub repo that you could download and test against your own code, right? You yeah. can say like, yeah. here's my here's my particular particular braid server implementation. And before I embarrass myself or whatever, I can download it, test everything, and then say, yeah, I think I'm conformant and I've got this test suite uh, running against it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not that, not that um, it yeah, would be I, embarrassing. We're all, we're all okay here showing our code. But I just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. And I can imagine having some code there that just like acts a little harness to be able to connect to an arbitrary braid server, um, you know, like with a HTTP client. Yeah. But um, yeah. You know, but it should be like language agnostic. So the whole point is that the test suite itself, you know, like I'd like the test suite to be written as like plain text of the, well, uh, of the, <laughs> The text file containing the bytes that go over the wire or that are expected to go over the wire and that's what actually gets sent and received so this should work for clients written in rust and go and in c and in you know python and in tickle t you know tcltk and whatever people want to do so yeah yeah cool. and, and with the goal that if it works with the test suite it should work with all of our client server implementations so yeah we need some kind of timeout or something so that like you know you get a subscription response within an acceptable period of time or something like that yeah, there's going to be some specifics, and I, I think the, the the first version, if it just like if it just does like if we just manually run the tests and then manually populate a table, that's totally fine. Sorry, people are doing things. Um, yeah. I I really liked the suggestions down there at the bottom too. Um, mm -hmm. It it feels like another thing that this 
test suite idea is articulating is all of the independent braid features that we're working on. And, um, uh, and it, we might also be creating them uh, for features before we've standardized them potentially. Like um, Bryn was bringing up the idea of if you have peer-to-peer -peer state that um, right now the U a URL for a resource tells you not just what the name of it is, but how to get it. It says you have to go to that domain name, look it up in DNS, and then do uh, open a TCP connection. But with peer-to-peer -peer state, you break where the resource is located from what it's named. And um, so, and Bryn wrote on there the idea of a state URI that allows you to separate those things. And we haven't done any standardization work on that yet, but it's a great idea and it'd be really um, nice thing to start having a, this seems like a nice catalog for everything we're working on, so. Yeah, totally. I, I also really like the idea of just having, I mean, like we've seen this in the GitHub issues already of like that PNG example. And then there's been some different questions that have popped up around, like what are the actual semantics here? You know, like what's actually, like, is this how it works? And I really like the idea of having some formal, you know, some like handwritten examples that are like, you know, here's, here's the semantics of this. Like, you know, we have readme files if we want of like, okay, you want to understand braid? Well, here's an example and here's what all the different things mean. You know, like this is, um, yeah, end of the form that we can all read and agree on. Um, and I think that would probably also like tighten some screws on the protocol itself, which I think would be really useful for us. You know, like I, you're making funny faces, Mike, and I, I suspect that for you, all of the semantics are clear, but like, you know, I, I don't know, like I think for, um, I think there's some things that I would appreciate, like, you know, as a form of another form of documentation or another way to consume that information. I would totally um, doing appreciate it. I did not mean that as a funny face. Um, no, it's okay. <laughs> that was my face of enlightenment. I was like, oh, I could see all that stuff we could do. I didn't mean to roll my eyes if that's what it looked like. No, you're right. That's fine. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling really thrilled right now seeing uh, a lot of our different ideas coming together and uh, it's just really exciting. We haven't had a video chat of a group this large, <laughs> I don't think, um, a lot of contributions. So. And, I, and, the, and it's like, and here's, here's a project to help organize all those different thoughts together too, which just mm. sounds great. Cool. All right. Um, well, people seem supportive uh, and I'm really loving all the messages. Please add more things if you're thinking of them. Um, uh, I'll probably do some point during the week. I'll make another repo in the braid organization uh, for these examples. Um, we can start, um, yeah, start putting the first few, you know, bricks on that wall uh, in there with different examples. And then, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I can also imagine like, <laughs> I'm anticipating like me writing some examples and then being subtly wrong in some different protocol level details. Um, so uh, yeah, Mike, if, I'd really appreciate it if you could, you know, help that, you know, eyeball what I'm writing down to make sure that it is actually like conformant with how you, you are matching the protocol itself. Cool. Cool. Thank you. That's great. Uh, okay. Well then, uh, any other comments on this, by the way, any, anything else before we move on? We're doing fine on time. Thumbs up from Ben. I like Ben's an expert at nonverbal communication in Zoom, it seems. Okay. Um, share screen. Okay, so let's do some protocol discussion. This is an exciting thing that I've seen the IETF's HTTP working group do. And um, I thought maybe we could emulate them. So this is all, these are all the topics that are currently uh, all the GitHub issues and pull requests that are currently tagged with Braid HTTP 03. And this is because we have some changes we need to make to the spec since Braid HTTP version two. And if you go to braid.org right now and you click on this to see the draft, you're seeing version two. So we're gonna go to version three. And when we go to version three, um, IETF knows about it and it'll update um, this date, it'll update this date. This draft is technically expired, but the expiration date doesn't mean anything in IETF world. It's just a thing. But um, in any case, it's definitely time to, update, to put up, put out a new draft. And so we've got all these issues tagged and uh, to help us get them done, it's nice to talk about them in person to see where everyone's feeling. So 
I went through and added some little yellow stickies being discussed to the ones that uh, I nominated us to talk through in this meeting. And you all can add things too. And um, we've got a half hour now to talk through issues. So um, I've opened in tabs, a bunch of these. Um, if anyone wants to suggest one, if there's anything that is on your mind or you have some thoughts on or you have some questions about, uh, please bring it up now and we'll go to it. Otherwise I'll nominate one. Going through an order is fine with me. Going in order is fine, you said? Yeah. Uh, sure, and, you know, and this first one's pretty interesting, I think. So we can do this. This is um, the idea, do we have an, a, let's click on this. Um, so the idea here is, and Dwayne, correct me if I'm wrong, but so in a subscription request, uh, so here's a subscription request. It gives you um, the normal um, HTTP response line, the headers of the request, and then the way that, and then HTTP breaks up the body from the headers with a blank line. And so what we're, what we're doing in the spec right now is putting a, um, a series of versions after this blank line. So we're taking inside of the body, we're encoding a sequence of versions. And the, the proposal here is that, well, actually, what if it was cool? Wouldn't it be kind of cool if the first version, if there was basically, if there was no blank line. So the proposal here is to get rid of this blank line. And you would still have blank lines after the subsequent versions, but that would make it so that the very first version looks just like a regular HTTP response, which matches the intuitive use case that you're gonna receive one HTTP response from a request with the then extension that all the stuff after that could be braid specific stuff. And we noticed, so, um, so we've got some idea. So we noticed that this could impact the idea of the current version because um, the current version header, the idea is that um, when you first connect to a server, it might give you a whole bunch of historical versions that gives you historical context. In addition to the final version in that bunch being the current version that the server actually has. But as a client, you don't know which one's the final version and which one is just a new update. So there is a current versions header that can tell you when you've received everything that the server thinks is up to date. And this impacts this design too, because it almost had the idea that, well, maybe this is the current version since it's the first thing coming back, but maybe the current version is coming up next. So I don't and know. Just what, to clarify what else, that, uh, that that's, that's at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, that's current at the time of the initial subscribe request, right? Yes, current at the time. It's, it's the version that the server had when the server received the subscribe request. Got it. Cool. Least, so we can, yeah. you can basically stay subscribed after the current version, but know that, um, uh, know that you've received a version at least as recent as when you made the request. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there's some use cases for that. Of like, you know, if I'm receiving a whole bunch of messages, I might not want to update the UI until I've received all of them. Like if I'm receiving them all, you know, in one big blob, um, and then I want to like update the UI after every change after that. And I don't want to have to kind of guess which one it is or what state I'm in or anything. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and this, I should also mention there's oh, yeah. two different, I feel like there's like something that comes in in this change, which I want to name and I don't know if it's been clearly named, which is that sometimes using Braid, um, what you want to do is when you connect, you want to get a copy of what the document looks like right now. And then you want to find out all the changes that happen from then. Um, oh, and I know that Sync9 thinks about this a bit differently, but um, that's like how it works in, in JDB, for example. You get a copy of the document right now, you don't get any history before then, and then you just get all the changes that happen while you're connected to the document. Um, or the other way you think about it sometimes is, uh, sorry, there's three ways. That's the first way. The second way is 
Um, sometimes you actually just like want the whole history of the document. And if using auto merge, you might need the whole history, which is sent in a compressed form so that you can merge any change that comes in from other peers and you're a full peer. And then the other, other way is that in ShareDB, if I connect, I get a full copy of the document, I receive a bunch of changes, then I disconnect, I go offline. Um, when I reconnect again, I don't actually want a new copy of the whole document because then I wouldn't be able to merge my local changes in. So in that case, I'm not getting one in the new subscription request. I'm actually just immediately getting sent versions. I don't want a copy of the document and then I'll merge those versions in locally. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I feel like there's an open question in my mind of how those different use cases end up being expressed, um, like end up being requested from the server or something like that. But I feel like that might be a bit of a tangent from this topic, from this issue. So would the concern be that, um, I guess a question would be, how might this issue interact with those different use cases? Right, exactly. And, and like, I can imagine something like, you know, we do this in the, if in, in only the case where the, um, uh, where the first message in the subscription is a document snapshot or something like that. Like, I don't think it would make sense to send patches in that format that Dwayne's suggesting, but I think it might make sense if we're sending a copy of what the document looks like right now. Okay, so let me maybe just try to enumerate these things on screen since we're share I'm sharing it. First message is document snapshot. Um, what's the next case? The next one is, uh, is, is the client receives all operations, aka auto merge. Um, in the first message or in separate messages? I'm not sure. That's okay. a different use case, but I'm not sure right. how it should be expressed. Okay. Yeah. And then the third case is the, the client. Yeah. Um, Uh, and then the, the last case is client reconnects and wants the changes that have happened since they last connected. Okay. Great. Some of the uh, uh, things that are also are also interesting, I think, are um, uh, whether or not an, a regular HTTP request that doesn't understand Braid um, gets something of value from that request and whether a braid augmented HTTP request will um, just happily, you know, uh, do the same thing and then add something. It would be kind of it would be kind of nice if those two things did occur, um, because then in an implementation uh, situation, you you have fewer fewer switches and fewer cases to worry about. You can basically just respond and then add things afterwards um, if if it's possible that they happen to match up like that. Um, otherwise, in the current implementations that I'm familiar with, uh, you kind of have to make a choice somewhere at the top that says, is this a regular braid request? Or sorry, is this a regular HTTP request? Or is this also, or is this instead an H, uh, a braid HTTP request? And then you, you kind of follow different paths uh, of implementation. I feel like we kind of already have a thing that does that. So my worry would be that in the current spec right now, if you interpreted the braid subscription response as a regular HTTP request, you would just be waiting a really long time. Like you would end up trying to consume the entire subscription, like every message you get back as the body of the document, which doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, and the client explicitly opts in and says, hey, like subscription keep alive, whatever it is to opt into the particular braid semantics. And yeah, I, I think I it's think okay at the saying, moment. Well, like, if that's I think we're saying the same thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you're saying that you wouldn't want a situation where a um, regular HTTP client asks for a document that has no end, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. So it, it it could conceivably like if the response has a content length for that first version, then I could imagine a client might and the connection, even though the server is keeping it open after the client consumes all of the content up to content links. That might work. I, I worry about what that would look like sending, then sending Braid through proxies. Like if we sent Braid through Nginx, then Nginx would close the connection if it didn't understand the subscription keep alive header um, as soon as it received that many bytes. Yeah, and we also have been, uh, like we have a different response code. I think we're using 209 instead of 200, mm -hmm. specifically so that 
proxies don't try to cash it in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the meantime, uh, just to name it, like in my Rust implementation, I couldn't actually use 209 because it's not in the enum of the HTTP library Ooh. server that I'm using. And I don't know what to do with that. Like that's, you know, like I can make my client support 200 as well, but um, there's, there's going to be some stickiness with that until we've got it, you know, until we've got the okay. RFC landing. Yeah, we yeah. might need to um, open it. It'd be probably good to open an issue for that because yeah. it'd be nice to solve that somehow. Definitely. Yeah, maybe I should um, raise an issue on the on the upstream uh, HTTP library I'm using. Just to clarify what this ticket is or what this issue is is asking for, Seth, um, it's not asking for a server response to continue to keep it open on a regular HTTP request. Um, it should close it. Uh, but that decision can come after it's done the sort of the first bit, if that makes sense. The request can come in, uh, the server can respond, uh, the, the server can respond without regard to special braidness until the, until the second patch, basically. And then, then it would have to make a decision and say, is this a rig? Did I see a subscribe header? Yes or no? If no, close the request. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so, uh, Dwayne, am I capturing? I, I tried to write down this question from something you said about a minute ago. I think this is what you're talking about. If it's mm -hmm. possible for non braid clients to fall back. And yep. okay, good. That, that also raises a question for me. Um, these subscription responses are only going to come back if there is a subscribe header present. And so I'm, I'm having trouble now imagining a case where a non braid aware client issues a subscribe request and then wants to be able to fall back to understanding it as a single version. Because it seems like in that case, it would have to, it would not put the subscribe header in there. Although Seth uh, mentioned proxies and maybe, maybe there's a case where there's a proxy in the middle. Although if there's a proxy in the middle, you know, it might break it too. Well, I, I think the use case that I'm kind of thinking of, besides the implementation simplification, the use case is, could you kind of have a poor man's subscribe by asking over and over again, right? Like a poll, in other words. So you, you would still need to get all of the headers back, um, like parents and version and merge type and so forth that are all specified in the first um, version there yeah you could totally do that um i think that would be a separate issue than this one because you just don't need i think i think this issue is only talking about subscriptions yeah with the subscribe header and you can do that polling thing without doing a subscription you can just poll for the current version and then right but yeah. doesn't that uh doesn't that eliminate the metadata um version parents merge type um, no, the meta, the, that other metadata is, you can still use the version, parents, all that stuff without the subscribe. I mean, in the response, does the response include that information if you haven't said this is a subscribe? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. All right. Okay. Uh, I didn't notice that in the spec, but maybe it's there somewhere and I skimmed past it. Um, the, I could also imagine in the spec, and this would be another way to achieve that, Dwayne. Um, and I've been thinking about it, raising an issue on this. So something Kafka does to be able to deal with back pressure, right? So like, let's say, let's say there's a huge volume of patches going through the system and some user is on a, you know, on a cell phone in India and they just have a really low bandwidth. You can run into a problem where the server's got all of these messages that are sitting in a buffer waiting to send to the client, but the client connection doesn't actually have enough bandwidth to support the patches. Um, what Kafka does is it says, uh, um, in the subscription request, you say, I want to receive up to hundred kilobytes of messages back and then the server closes the connection as soon as that 100 kilobytes have been sent. The client then reopens or re-requests for the next 100 kilobytes. And that way the server never needs a buffer to store like all of the ongoing messages because the client's reconnection will then request the old messages and then, then it does whatever it needs to do to handle that. Um, so I've been thinking about having like, you know, proposing a different subscribe, you know, <laughs> byte limit range to say, I want to subscribe, but only send me like, you know, only send me 10 kilobytes of data. I can imagine something like this with that of like, but it, like a different variant, which is like subscribe, but only sending one patch or like one message. And then it would send that one message. It's, it's a subscription, it's just limited to one message. 
then the HTTP request closes. And then you can send a new HTTP request later if you want to poll for more patches or whatever else you want. It should be a different approach there. I like that. Really cool. Uh, what, uh, while Mike's typing, what happens if you over or underestimate the, uh, let's say that you say 100 kilobytes, but the message, the minimum size for one message is a megabyte. Does it send it anyway? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think Kafka, the Kafka's implementation, what I'd imagine is like, I mean, um, Foundation EV actually has a similar process. Basically, you say like, I want about a megabyte of data, or I want about 10 kilobytes. And then the server will like, you know, send you at minimum one message and it might go over, and it might, you know, like if it sends you a hundred messages, cool. it might, you know, stop when you close or something, but it's, cool. yeah. Great. Um, this, this looks like a lot of good progress on this issue now. Um, I'm thinking uh, maybe we can, maybe this is time to hit com comment and go on to yeah. the next one. Yeah, okay. I think so. This has great. been great. Thank you for uh, taking cool. some time here. Nice. Okay. What do we got next? Um, animation subscribe response. Is that? Let's just click on it. Okay. Um, would someone like to? I haven't actually read this recently. Uh, would someone like to? Oh, Dwayne, what would you like to discuss? Great. Uh, yeah. Well, so one one question is: um, Is this a good example? Uh, so the the the, the uh, spec shows a PNG file um, being updated with versions and specific content bytes ranges being updated. And I think Seth's point is that um, this doesn't make sense for a PNG file because it's compressed and like the size of the file might change and the particular bytes don't make sense in a compressed form. Um, yeah, I just want to bring oh, yeah. Ben actually up in this issue originally. Ben, you're yeah. here on the call. Do you want to? Do you want to? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in the uh, in the actual spec, you're just getting the changes uh, when it would make sense to also get the initial data uh, in the response because it's actually inconsistent with some of the other examples. So uh, in general, this is a bug report, um, I think, with one of the examples to make it more consistent with one of the other examples. And then there's also a more general uh, question about whether PN, PNG or originally it was J, uh, it was GIF, and then they uh, changed it to uh, or GIF, and then they changed it to PNG. And PNG seems better, but then if there's still something else that's better, then that'll be fine. But but mainly it's a bug report on on I think it should be including the initial data, and I. I'm uh, looking at those the the actual links up there. So I've got the uh, the first link is the issue, and then um, oh, yeah, hold up. Let me open up the links as well. Da -da -da. There was also an interesting point that I think Phoenix made. I don't know them, but uh, they're on the uh, Braid Discord, and they said there's a there's already a spec that allows for modifying uh, images that create the illusion of animation. Um, so it, was, it, was, it seemed to them that it was sort of un unnecessary to give this example since we already have a, an IETF spec on this. That's cool. So I, I, I wrote this initially. My intent was just to come up with some uh, some demo or something that kind of had a visual or aesthetic mm -hmm. component to it. Um, but it would be great to have something a little bit more useful and realistic. So I'm super in favor of replacing it. We could also remove it. Um, the fact that it got a lot of attention makes me think that maybe it's useful in some sense. I, I vote for it being useful. I actually think that the discussion that we have around the semantics of this is exactly the discussion we need to have. Um, so, you know, like around the semantics of great itself. I don't think the problem is the example. I think the problem is that there's some things that feel a bit ambiguous or underspecified or something. So I'm in yeah. favor of keeping it and having that Great. conversation. Yeah. I, I also think, because uh, originally when I posted it, it's because the one on IETF uses uh, uh, GIF uh, when the latest draft uh, uses PNG. So I, I still think 
uh, PNG is fine. GIF is confusing because GIFs already have uh, animation support. But yeah, specifically for the bug uh, in uh, uh, chapter three, I guess, uh, the first response in the subscription is the entire body. So the initial version, and then these are the changes uh, since. Whereas in the uh, chapter 5.1 example, you're just getting the changes. Um, so it's not consistent with what happened in uh, chapter three. And uh, it also doesn't particularly uh, seem maybe, maybe it needs to be specified to say like from which version, but here, uh, because how do we know um, which version these changes should come through? It seems like in this case, because we're not saying just give me changes from this version, it should also be including the, uh, the initial data as it did in chapter three. Yeah, I think that would be a much better example. So I'm fully in, in favor of re giving the first response with a full snapshot of the PNG. Um, and then uh, we might, it's sounding like we have some question about like the spec itself being ambiguous about the different ways that you can send these updates. And so it might also be good to have some more clarity, maybe a section showing that you can send back. It sounds like actually the, the cases that Seth was talking about earlier, when you get a response, when you, maybe you want to get a full snap, snapshot first, maybe you want to get a whole sequence of versions, and maybe you want to get uh, just patches since the last time you reconnected. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, we can, let's write that in. Um, I'm going to copy paste the uh, comment from Phoenix. I finally found it. Um, oh, great. They, they suggested uh, that this is a standard uh, that's been around for 20 years. The multi-part X mixed replace is how old JPEG webcams stream out their video. <laughs> kind of cool. Wow. Lots in the past. <laughs> um, I, I know Phoenix, by the way, like, yeah, I met them, what, six or seven years ago, and we've barely talked since then, but cool. um, yeah, they're just here in Sydney somewhere as well. While Mike's writing, can someone answer the question, is this example with a PNG, like I load a page, the PNG shows up as a complete image, and then a second later, it changes completely? Yeah, that's that's the idea. Um, and the, the client would have to have a braid aware PNG viewer. Okay. Right, right. Okay. So it's a little bit far fetched. Because you well, could- right, hopefully... Sorry, you could hopefully we could. Oh, okay. You, you go, <laughs> Andrew. You could confuse it with like streaming a large PNG file or something at first glance. I mean, once you know what braid's all about, you, you make that doesn't make sense. But at first glance, it's like you're getting parts of the image or you're getting complete Whoa. images. That might actually worth clarifying in the spec itself um, because that's that's, an, that's a question that a lot of other people might get confused by. And then, yeah, it'd be worth just adding, adding some copy around that. Okay, can can you tell me what to type in, or can someone can add can someone add that comment, please, <laughs> so I can yeah. understand that. Yeah. So in the last part of the second bit in the uh, original post, I also kind of mentioned what that could probably look like, where if the browser includes okay uh, an image source and then an animated braid PNG. Uh, so in the uh, issue, I mean. So in the yeah, you see it right there. So. Original post, top of the page. Uh, I, I'll share my screen. <laughs> uh, so yeah, here. So I, cause I was wondering what the use case for this would be. So then I brainstormed what's well, probably something like this where you then either have a JavaScript polyfill uh, that is continuing to subscribe or, or you actually work with the browser vendors to add, to say, hey, if there is a, a um, keep alive, then it does actually continue to refresh that image, even though it's not actually an animation based uh, image format, because of that keep alive, it can continuously amend that media resource. Um, so uh, it probably the request here or the further issue uh, is clarify the uh, use case 
or or the implementation details because right now it's saying hey this could be used to animate a png however uh, it's got no details on implementation but even so implementation maybe it just needs to say implementation is beyond the requirements of the specification Cool. There's another use case that just came to mind too. We could use this for, um, uh, you know, what, back in the dial-up days, you, you'd load an image and it would show like the blurry version first and then it would fill in the lines. We could kind of like fill in, in between lines and show that this could be done case by case on the server without having to, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it says. Well, I, I wonder if this is an opportunity to also show off um, a different type of um, patch a uh, range patch type uh, because you could say specify a rectangle right like this is a uh, image slash rectangle patch type and so now you're feeding a new png image into an old png but you're also specifying you know a width height xy coordinate like this part of the image has to change this part of the image has to change you know something like that actually maybe instead of thinking about this image we could think about it as a canvas and then <laughs> Like the initial message could say, like, here's map for the canvas, and then a series of patches that are like, now draw this rectangle, now draw oh, this there text, and so now it's going to animate it. That's cool. Like animate a flash. That would be cool. That would be a really sweet demo to make, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, SVG. Yeah. Updating, Isn't live it? updating an SVG or a, yeah, or a canvas, either one. The operations on an SVG, uh, like, seem a bit complicated, but the operations on canvas are just like the canvas operations themselves of like context of fill rec, context of build text and so on. So that might be easier to implement and express in the spec. But either way, I think that'd be a really sweet demo. Um, like a, yeah. Um, but I do like the idea of like, you know, being like, oh, you know, here's an example. And then this example uses like custom patch types, you know, so, you know, application specific patch types like this, you know, ad hocly implemented uh, express patch uh, canvas thing or something. With with the SVG or HTML uh, example or XML, because they're both uh, XML, it's kind of like reinventing a uh, live updating iframe where, where if you can like subscribe to a, yes. a HTML page, then you have a, uh, uh, an iframe that's actually updating its state. Yeah. Which is kind I mean, of interesting in terms of uh, uh, what's the word, um, can kind of like web components, but they actually stay up to date. Yeah, yeah, it's totally a tangent, but um, we're having Dwayne and I were having a conversation with Angela the other day, and something that um, that's I thought that sparked to me was the idea of having a stream of patches, like HTML patches, so a document that's an HTML document, and then like if we can express a stream of updates to the HTML document itself, you could have a web page that you know if it was supported by the browser, it wouldn't need any JavaScript at all to automatically be updating itself, um, which you know, I'm not sure if that's useful, but it would be it would be cool to make. It's I've just added that as a comment too. So we can, th these are all great examples to put in here. I think we could have a long example session. Yeah. Wonderful. As long as you could uh, pin a version or something or go back versions, that would be useful. <laughs> Otherwise you just, stuff keeps changing on the page. You can't read it. <laughs> no JavaScript. Yeah, totally. Well, oh. we're, we're, we're at about time. Um, any, so I don't think we can do any more issues, but we can talk for two minutes now about anything. Uh, just from a structure point of view, I, I noticed that we got to the issues and then we opened up more questions and more thoughts, which is great. Um, I, I think ideally we want to start decreasing the number of open questions in the issues. Um, so I'm not sure like what change needs to happen for that to happen, but um, I think I'll, I'll go with me, like I'd like for us to be able to start closing some of these issues uh, and doing that in the lead up to releasing a new version of the spec. Yeah, is there, maybe we need a label on the issues of whether or not they need actions um, or, you know, if they're blocked and they need more information. Because um, some are probably that we already know what they need to do, they just need to be done. And then others, there may actually be contentions like the, um, that first one that was discussed, like it needed to be evaluated further. Yeah, I think I, uh, for what it's worth, I'll probably take a pass through all of the issues again at the end of this week.
And yeah. I think a lot of, I think a number of them are waiting on some implementation or some code. Some of them might be just waiting for consensus. Yeah, I guess we should figure it out. It'd be nice to have maybe an overview of where we're at. So maybe I can take a lead on that. Don't really appreciate that. Uh, That's a good idea. While we're talking about the spec, at the by the end of today, I recorded this like a, a month ago, uh, but it's me reading through the actual spec and then adding commentary uh, and questions and kind of going through it as I think. So I need to actually edit out because kind of reading code examples of trees was kind of an interesting experience for me from the typical reading aloud uh, normal text documents. So I'll uh, get that finished today and put that up and I'll share it on the um, the the discord that sounds really fun wow it sounds like an hour and 40 minutes long it probably won't turn out to be that because a few times i read through the uh code example and i was like okay now i actually understand what the code example is and then i can uh, <laughs> read through it again so yeah that seems good i was just in, i was just impressed that's a lot of that's dedication yeah. All right, we're at time. I'm going to have to take off. Does anybody else want to stay on? Um, if you do, raise your hand and I'll give you Zoom control. I think I'll leave, but I do want to talk to some people, at least Dwayne. Do you, what, when, when did we, would you like to talk? I have about 15 minutes now, if you'd like to. Oh, okay. Well, maybe, yeah. Why don't you uh, put one of us as the Zoom person? Done. Great. Proceed. I'm going to head off as well. Brain. All right. Can I just say Can one thing? Everyone? Yeah. Real quick. Yeah. Uh, just at the very end, you were talking about closing issues. And I just want to ask if the whole test suite thing can't sort of, isn't like a part of this sort of synergy where yes, things are closed, somehow I think so. they go into the you know spec and they're test bedded in implementations and then they're discussed, they go into spec, you know? There's, there's definitely a TDD approach, which is like, you know, um, the code hasn't even been started to be worked on until the test's written, like <laughs> the test is yeah. the spec. I, um, I don't know which don't came know. first, the chicken or the egg, but I think it's part yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be really sweet. Like, I think it'd be really sweet if once we've got to this point, someone, you know, like say Dwayne's issue, like, hey, this is a suggestion we do something like this. This is what that would look like. So here's, I've taken an example from the test suite and then adapted it. Um, sorry, I forgot to say, <laughs> uh, yeah. That would be cool. I would not think I'll, I'll, I'll check out whatever you publish as far as test suites go, and I'll definitely give it a once cool. over. That'd be, that'd be really sweet. I appreciate it. Cool. All right. Everyone. Okay. Bye, everyone. See you later.